All right, praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles this morning, if you would, with me. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. I'm glad you're here this morning. Appreciate you putting up with me while we're without a pastor. As I say every week, uh, I am an evangelist now. And uh, so uh, here's, what, here's what, the pastor is your shepherd, amen. He loves you, he leads you, and he feeds you. An evangelist is a sheepdog. He comes and nips at your heels to get you back in line. Amen. And uh, so that's kind of preaching I did. I've looked through my sermons. I pastored for 26 years. I have over 3,000 sermons, almost 4,000 sermons. I looked through them from time to time. And I realized the people I pastored for 26 years had an evangelistic pastor. Amen. And I was always challenging them. I was an old high school football coach. And uh, when the Lord called me to preach, and I played football in high school and college, and my goal in life was to be a, uh, was try to play the pros, but I was too small for that. And so then I was going to be a college football coach. And so all my life, uh, it's been my, my goal and my motive and my desire to see people uh, succeeding, see people uh, pushing themselves. Amen. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that the Christian life should always be lived in forward gear, amen? Never in neutral and never in reverse, amen? I never met an athlete who was satisfied. When you get satisfied, you're done. One of the shortest sermons I ever preached was a sermon entitled Satisfied, in which I preached on the danger of getting satisfied, amen? The greatest man who ever lived, the greatest Christian who ever lived, in my estimation, the Apostle Paul said, I have not apprehended. And I keep pressing toward the mark. Amen. And so, uh, and so that's the kind of preaching I do. And I'm glad you don't you keep coming back. I told my folks that I pastored for 26 years. I don't know any place I can preach like I do. And people keep coming back and hearing you. Amen. So appreciate you being here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. If you'll look there in the Word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. We'll read a very lengthy portion of Scripture. So you follow along as I read. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. The Apostle Paul asked the question, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Let me just say here that in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing an attitude that they had towards him. Paul, for some reason, though Paul had led these people to the Lord and ministered to them, they had become, they were a carnal church, and say so they were puffed up. They had divisions. They were puffed up over Paul and over Cephas and over Apollos. I believe Paul started the church, and I believe Apollos became the pastor after him. I believe that he said, I have laid a foundation. Let him be carefully built. I have planted, Apollos watered. And I believe Apollos became the pastor. And I'm going to say to you, just to say to you, that um, uh, we should not follow personalities. Amen. Uh, we should follow God, amen, and we shouldn't get wrapped up in, uh, uh, in, in personality contests, amen. But what happened was these folks began to, uh, somebody was saying negative things about Paul, and people were listening to it. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by God, said, you need to deal with this, amen. And that's not the message, but I want you to see the context. Let me say, the church at Corinth, those people were saved, but they were the most carnal people there were in that day. It was not a message of commendation. It was a message of condemnation. He didn't write them to pat them on the back. He wrote them kind of in your face to say, you folks are a bunch of carnal. Carnal means worldly Christians. You guys are, you guys are wicked. They had men in the end. They couldn't control their passions, so they were going and, and practicing harlotry. They had a man in there that was living with his stepmother. He'd, he'd taken his stepmother from his dad and was living out of wedlock with her. And they were puffed up and fighting about personalities. And uh, it, it was a mess. They, they were misabusing the Lord's Supper. They were using it as a fellowship time, and each person was bringing in their own food. And so the rich were bringing in a big meal, and the little poor were over here with their sack lunch. And man, Paul says, that's not the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is what we do down there with the, with the wafers and the grape juice, amen. That's the Lord's Supper. So they were a wicked group of people, amen. And so Paul, is a, he's, he's, a, he's addressing this, and he looks at uh, verse 2, if I am not apostle, uh, if, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye 
in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister? Remember, Paul didn't get married, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Who goeth the warfare at any time at his own charges? You remember, Paul never took, a, uh, never took money for his ministry. Amen. And in uh, and, and verse number uh, f- f- seven, who goeth a warfare at any time in his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be taker of his hope. He's talking there about a man of God being, pay, uh, being, being paid a salary. Amen. Verse 11, if, ye, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, this is a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things. If others be partakers of these powers over you, are, we, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have not used none of these, I have used none of these, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I receive a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law is without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof, with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity this morning to preach. Help me to be what I need to be for you and your people. Fill me with your spirit. Speak to us today, and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I I read a lengthy passage of Scripture, but our message comes this morning out of verse 23, where Paul makes this statement. Look at it. And this I do for the gospel's sake. This I do for the gospel's sake. I want to preach this morning a message entitled that, This I Do for the Gospel's Sake. Years ago, my wife and I, when I was teaching school in western Kansas, my first teaching job in Lewis, Kansas, we went to the Kinsley Baptist Church in Kinsley, Kansas, and our pastor was Brother Joe White and his wife Mary, and they were taking the teenagers to Silver State Youth Camp, and they asked my wife and I to go along because in the summertime I I did work a job, but I I worked at a co-op, and I was able to get off, and we took the week, and we went to camp. There was an old pastor out there by the name of can't remember his last name now. Remember his name? Dan. Uh, huh? No. I don't remember his name. Dan Allen. Brother Dan Allen. He was, in his, he was in his late 70s or early 80s. And every week he taught. And he taught on the Beatitudes all week long. But one of the statements he made every day that arrested my attention, he made this statement, live in the Bible, visit good books. Live in the Bible, visit good books. And that arrested my attention, and I had never read my Bible through in my life. I got saved when I was five, but I'd never read my Bible through. I didn't live in my Bible. I took my Bible to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, and then it went up on the shelf, and that's the last time it was touched, and I didn't live in the Bible. In fact, a situation took place in our church. We lost our pastor, and, and we had a real bad fight going on, and, and uh, we had some stuff going on, and, and it broke my wife and my heart, and God said to me, if you knew your Bible, this wouldn't be happening. And that's when I began to start studying my Bible. 
But he said, live in the Bible, visit good books. And, and so I took that to heart, and I began to start studying my Bible. But then also I began to uh, uh, start getting into good books. And some of the books I got into were books by Dr. John R. Rice and uh, Lee Robertson and men like this, Curtis Hudson, books on uh, the Bible, theological-type books. But some of the books that God got, got brought across my path were biographies biographies, the, 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 the writings of the life of the servants of God, D.L. Moody, uh, Charles Spurgeon, um, uh, uh, the, the book Through Gates of Splendor, where, the, where Jim Elliott and those uh, other four missionaries gave their life for the cause of Christ. And what I found was that what really set my soul on fire and burned my heart was when I read about truly great Christians. When I read about people who were who were who 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 lived it instead of talked it, amen. Some people who were on fire. I mean, when they were consumed with it. You see, I'd been in a church where my pastor preached right. He preached straight. He preached against everything he preached against. He was against everything I did. It seemed, amen. He preached the book straight and right, and everybody said amen, but nobody lived it. And the truth of the matter is that I began to look at that, and I knew I wasn't living it because I was living in sin. But I got to say to myself, look, I am not going to be a hypocrite. I am not going to go to church and say amen and act like I'm doing living Christian when I'm not. I'm not going to go to church, have the preacher say this, and go out and live another way. And so what I did, I did wrong, but what I did, I just decided to quit going to church. I met my wife. She was lost. I witnessed to her. She wasn't saved, but she told me she was. I wanted to marry her, so it didn't matter to me. Amen. So I married a lost woman, which was against God's will. God graciously, uh, she got saved two months after uh, we got married. Graciously, God saved her soul. And then I realized she needed to get in church, and she needed to learn the Bible. And God began to use the Bible to work in my heart. And then he introduced me to Dan Allen, who said, live in the Bible and visit good books. And I began to live in the Bible and visit these books that taught Bible. Bible truth, but really to visit these books that were about the lives of people who really, really were on fire for God. And I'll tell you what, it changed my life. I quit being a, a pew sitter and I became a participant. I quit being a, and I'm not, I'm no great Christian, I'm the worst Christian I know, but I quit being one who could just sit, 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 soak and sour. I had to get up and do something for the cause of Christ. Can I tell you that the greatest need in God's work today is for people to get up and do something? Can I tell you that just getting knowledge is not going to make us great Christians? You see, there is an acquisition and then there's an application. Can I tell you that everything in here that God commanded, He will not do for you? Amen. If He commanded you to do it, you're, you're waiting around for God to do that. It ain't going to happen. Go ye. You're waiting around for God to, to get you to go. He ain't gonna, it ain't going to happen. You see, if God commanded it, that means He's not going to do it. He's expecting you and I to do it. And I, I love people that, that, that motivate me. I love people that incite me to do things. I, I like people that challenge me, amen. Some Christians don't want to be challenged. Some Christians don't want to be incited to do anything. Some Christians have become lukewarm, Laodicean Christians. What does that word lukewarm mean there? Well, I heard a preacher say one time it means God saying, I wish you were cold, I wish you were lost, I wish you were saved, but he doesn't want anybody to be lost. And so I said, God, that's not what it means. Show me. He said, Ted, have you ever been cold? Have you ever been cold? I said, sure, in Kansas with the wind blowing and, you know, nothing to stop it, amen. It's 35 below and 30 degrees out and a wind chill of about 10. I mean, we've been cold this week, amen. And he, and he said to me, were you comfortable? I said, no, God, I wasn't comfortable. He said, you ever been hot? Yeah, bailing that hay, 100 degrees outside, 130 degrees up there in that metal barn, putting those last bales up in there, all that green stuff all over you and in your nose and everywhere else, amen, and sweat pouring off of you and your arms all scratched up. I said, God, I've been hot. He said, comfortable. He said, that's the way the last day church is going to be. They're going to be comfortable. Comfortable with sitting, soaking, and souring. There's not going to be any motivation in their life to step up and do anything. And listen, I travel this nation as an evangelist, and I'm just telling you, most Christians have reached a comfort zone. We're happy. We think I've arrived, or this is where I'm going to stay because this is where I'm comfortable. And I just like people that challenge me. You know, my job as a football coach was to kick some players in the backside. I didn't do it physically. 
They used to do it when I played, but I didn't do it physically. But you know what? Somebody had to drive us and push us. My coach used to, used to kick us in the seat. My coach used to grab us by the shirt collar and slam us up against the wall. Those days are long gone. You can't touch the little babies. Amen. God forbid that somebody might tell them to do something they don't want to do. God forbid they might have to go out and get and, and really work at it. Amen. But listen, and so I, I'm, I'm challenging. As I read the Bible, certain phrases jump out to me. And one day I was reading this passage of Scripture where Paul said, This I do for the gospel's sake. And that jumped out of me. And the question came to my mind, What are you doing for the gospel's sake? Ted, what are you doing for the gospel's sake? I mean, you're saved, right? You're on your way to heaven. You've accepted Christ as Savior, and you know that people need to accept Christ as Savior. And I want to know, Ted, what are you doing for the gospel's sake? And so I began to think about the life of the Apostle Paul. And I think about it, and here Paul tells us some things that he didn't do. He said he didn't eat or drink of the provision that was rightfully his. He said, I didn't take anybody's food. He could have taken it because he was a preacher. And preachers should be paid when they work, amen? And they should receive it. He said, I didn't do that. This I do for the gospel's sake. I chose not to partake of the provision. Now, that he wasn't teaching that that's the way it should be. He's trying to say to you, look, as an example, this is what I did. I chose not to take the profession. He said he didn't get himself a wife. He said, can't I lead around a sister, a wife like Peter and the rest of them? But you know what Paul said? I chose not to be a wife. You know what he goes on and says in one passage of Scripture? I believe it's in this same passage, in this same book, or 2 Corinthians. He said, I would that everybody's like me, for they that have a wife care more about how to please their wife than how to please the Lord. And they that have a husband care more how to please their husband than how to please the Lord. You know, he said, I just chose for the gospel's sake to remain unmarried. I chose to stay single so I could be single-minded. Single. Now, he wasn't teaching that you should do that. He said, if you can't contain, and then marry. But he was trying to give us an example. He's the kind of guy that incites me, incites me to step up and do more than I'm doing. Listen to you. I, I don't believe this. I am not doing one-tenth of what I ought to do for God. You know, serving God is not just for the preacher. Serving God is for everybody. We are all supposed to be. I, I, I was looking at this word, uh, this passage this morning. I can't remember the passage. But it says, I want you to produce those things that accompany salvation. You know, salvation is just the beginning, not the end. A lot of us believe because I'm saved, that's all I need. No, we are saved unto good works, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We ought to be on fire for God. I mean, I had players. I don't want this kind of player comes out to the game like this. Ho oh, hum. It's game time. Can't wait till this over so I can go home and watch TV. I quit preaching went to meddling, didn't I? I don't know what you're so excited about. I do. Jesus saves. Amen. That's what to be excited about. Amen. There's a hell and there's a heaven and you can have it. That's what to be excited about. Amen. Wichita's dying and going to hell. That's something to get excited about. Now, you can't get a holy grunt out of God's people. You can't get a smile. You can't get a facial inspection. You can't get people to move to the altar. And you sure can't get them to go out and do anything for the gospel's sake. Amen. I don't, I'm not trying to be mean, but I don't think that's what God intended for our churches to be. A place where a bunch of people come and take up 18 inches of the pew and soak in a bunch of preaching and then go out and do nothing with it. Amen. And so Paul excites me, amen. He didn't stop working a secular job. He didn't take advantage of his right to live the gospel. Then next he lists some things that he did do. You see that? He lists some things that he did do. What did he do? He became all things to all men that he by my son means, uh, my son means win some. He said, look, I just did these things. Why? Because I was concerned that the gospel get done. Hey, you and I ought to be concerned that the gospel gets out to this city. We ought to be concerned that the Lord's work gets built. We ought to be doing some things for the gospel's sake. And I'm not criticizing, condemning you this morning, me this morning. Each one of us needs to take a good look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what am I doing? for the gospel there's a lot of things we're doing for the bank account there's a lot of things we're doing for the material possessions those are not those are not wrong 
I believe if you'll serve God, I believe God wants you to be a success. I believe God is a capitalist. Amen. I believe God says work hard and you'll have a big reward. Amen. And if you don't work, we shouldn't eat. Amen. I believe that. But God never intended for you and I to be so intense with the capitalism, so intense with the finances, so intense with the material possessions, and be so lackadaisical about doing things for the gospel. Amen. Ask yourself this week, what did you do for the gospel's sake? What did you personally do for the gospel's sake? And ask what you did for the furtherance of your career. I'm going to ask you what you did for, for, for education or for, 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 for material possessions. But what did you do for the gospel? Say, listen, I'm going I'm to sit up here and I say this everywhere I go. And I mean with all my heart. Some people in might believe it. But I'll tell you what, I'm the worst Christian I know. Because I don't know what you should have done and didn't do. But I know what I should have done and didn't do. And I know what I shouldn't have done that I did do. And I don't know what you shouldn't have done that you did do. But I know what I did. I know what I did for the gospel's sake this week. And it was not very much. Honest oh, truth. I did go out yesterday and make some visits. And I thank God I did that. But you know what? I could have done more. You see, I could have done more. I, I, I have a battle with my flesh. My flesh doesn't want to go. My flesh doesn't want to get out there. My flesh doesn't want to sacrifice. My flesh wants to get fulfilled. My flesh wants to give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And the crucified life says I can't give. I get, get, I've got to give. I've got to give. I've got to give. And I don't like living that way. But he challenges me. And so this morning, very quickly, I want to see some things that Paul did for the gospel's sake. We're just going to look at some scripture. And I hope they'll challenge you. Let them speak to your heart. That's what scripture's there for, to speak to your heart. Why would God record these things? Why would God say to Paul, record this about your life? except that that's there for you and I to learn something. These things are in samples. They're given to us that we, through patience and comfort of the Scripture, might have hope and that they might be examples. And I, I want to be stirred up. I mean, I tell you, Moody stirred me up. The, Lord, God, the world has yet to see someone who is totally dedicated to God. Stirred me up. Finney got saved and got filled with the Holy Ghost on the same day. And when Finney would walk in places, people would get saved by just his presence. They would come under conviction, and he would lead them to Christ by just his presence. That's not Acts. That's not Acts. That's in the 1800s in this country. Those things, they stir me up. Why can't we see that today? We can see it today, but we're going to have to decide what we're going to do for the gospel. Amen. And I give you some, uh, some, some truth. That sign out there has brought very few people to this church. I put it back on the board. You go back and look at it. The survey done. 70 plus percent of people said the reason they came to a church was because somebody invited them. They're out there. We got a church over here. We'd like to have you come. Anybody can do that. So I don't know if I can give them the gospel. You can give them an invite. Amen. Amen. For the gospel's sake. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. But what things were... Oh, Philippians 3. Are you there? Did I give you that yet? I'm sorry. Philippians 3. I got them in my notes. You know, I'm sorry. I just run like a crazy man. You know, my wife, when my wife met me, you know what I said to her? I'm like the quick, quick, the quick rabbit. You know, Nestle's quick. I'm quick. I'm quick. I can't do anything slow. Amen. Now, I, I was ADHD as a kid growing up. I'm just ADD now. I'm getting too old to be hyperactive, amen. But look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, if you would, please. Look what Paul says. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For I am to suffer the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Look at that. Paul said, the things that were gained to me, I counted them all loss. You remember what Paul did? Paul turned his back on his Pharisee faith. He was very, very wealthy to be a part of that. He was very, very powerful. And he turned his back on all of it and said, none of that matters because all I want to do is I want to serve God and I want to win Christ. And he wasn't saying that you've got to win Christ to be saved. He was saying this, I, God has a course for me. God has a race for me. And I want to be a winner in that race. 
Can I say this to you? You need to understand this. That God, everybody in here that's saved, God has a purpose for your life. And you ought to want to win that purpose. You see, I used to run track. I used to run the 180-yard low hurdles. They don't have those anymore. Back in the dark ages when I was growing up, I ran the 180-yard low hurdles. And I never ran that race to lose. I ran that race to win. We, we run our Christian life to lose. Paul said, I don't fight uncertainly. They that run in a race run all, but one receive the prize. So run that you may obtain. Don't run haphazardly. Don't pee your body out of suggestion. You keep it in suggestion. You don't beat wildly. You get, you get disciplined. We need to discipline Christianity that says this is what I'm going to do for the cause of Christ. God wants me to go talk to that person. God wants me to go run that bus route. God wants me to teach that Sunday school class. God wants me to do this. And I'm going to pay the price that it takes for the gospel's sake. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hey, there's nothing better you can invest in. And I promise you when you get to heaven, you'll be glad you did. And how sad we're going to be when we get to heaven. And we left it all behind. Like that rich fool. His barns couldn't handle it. Luke chapter 12. So he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down. I'll build bigger. I'll put up all my store and I'll retire. Time for retirement. I'm going to just eat, drink, and be merry. But something happened that night. God said, thou fool. God called him that. I didn't. Foolish man, you got all that stuff, but now you're going to die tonight. <laughs> then who shall all these things be? He said, and God, so, so is everyone who's rich toward himself, but not rich toward God. What have I done for the gospel's sake? What have I done? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 with me. Verse 22, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Just a quick look at the Apostle Paul's life. Try to get you out of here at a good time. Amen. So the pot roast doesn't burn. My brother Houston's preaching, he usually have burnt sacrifice for dinner. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse to my folks knew this not to turn it and not have it done till 1230 or quarter till one. Amen. Are they Hebrews? Verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm more in labors. Now watch this. Watch. Here's what he did for the gospel. In labors, more abundant. Paul was a hard worker. Paul wasn't lazy. He's a hard worker. In stripes above measure. He said, I can't, even, I can't even count the number of times I've been whipped. Are you like me? I'm, a, I'm, such, a, I'm such a wimp. I'm such a coward. I go to somebody's door and a little old lady looks at me crossways and I'm ready to quit. I go, Price of God, you know, she looked at me so strange. I just know it's not fair. That's what I do for the gospel's sake. I wimp out and act like a baby. Paul was beaten. I mentioned my prayer this morning. I have been so, 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 I don't know what the word is, uh, embarrassed, motivated by what's going on under ISIS. I've been embarrassed by Coptic Christians who would die for Christ, and I won't even mention his name. Catholics who do not believe in the grace, uh, grace uh, salvation like we do, but they'll die for Christ. I'm not condemning those people. I'm saying, listen to me, that it's a shame to me that there are people that, that, that are dying for the cause of Christ when we're not. Now, I don't think we ought to go out and try to be a martyr. But truth of the matter is, is that it ought to motivate us. When I read Jim Elliott and Through Gates of Splendor, it motivated me that five young men would die instead of using the gun they had to kill those Indians. The reason being because they knew if they killed them that no white man would ever be able to take the gospel to them. And they wanted to leave the door open so they gave their life for Christ. And later Jim Elliott's wife and Nate Saint's sister went into that village and led the man to Christ that killed their loved ones. And I'd read that book and weep like a baby and say, Oh God, I do so little. I have so little character. I'm so little of a Christian. 
Listen, I'm telling you, I want to be stirred up and motivated. I don't want to be a lazy, lackadaisical, uh, lukewarm Christian. I don't want to be somebody that saves himself. But I sure have a battle. My flesh really wants to save itself. Boy, I don't want to be a part of that crowd that has to pay a big price. Look what he says next. In prisons, more frequent. But you and I go to prison for the Lord. They may come in America. In death, oft, he says. Well, how can he die often? He said, I was in places where my life, I was, they, uh, it, was a, it was a life or death situation. I have faced death often, Paul said. I have looked death in the faith, and I did it all for the gospel's sake. Amen. Look at verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. I've never been beaten once. He got 39 stripes five times. 196 stripes from the Jewish people. He said he'd been in other stripes often. How many times was the Apostle Paul? You know what he said in one passage? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, literally, if I take off my shirt and show you my back, I can show you the marks I've received for being a Christian. Thrice I was beaten with rods, verse 25. Once I was stoned. You remember that story? Left for dead. Thrice I, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeying often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. I've been in very many perilous situations, in weariness. Boy, I'm tired. Everybody's tired. Amen. I hear this all the time. I'm tired. So am I. And I say it all the time too. But that doesn't excuse us. Amen. Brother Jim Beller used to say, tired people rule the world. And one pastor's uh, wife was saying something to me about being tired, and I said, well, tired people rule the world. She says, and I know I tell my husband, I don't want to rule the world. <laughs> amen. In weariness often, amen. In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often, in hunger and thirst. In fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things are which out, that which cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. You know, he said, and if that's not enough, every church I pastored, I have to keep, 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 keep. You know, one of the difficult things about a pastor that makes you worry is you have to keep pushing people. You have to keep keeping people moving. Amen. I remember Dr. Bob Buchanan down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was preaching at camp one year up at Cedar River. And he said this statement. He said, sometimes I just go down to the canal down there in Baton Rouge. He said, I just sit on the dike and I watch the tugboats go by pushing the, pushing the, the uh, what do they call those things? What? Barges. That's what they call them. I'm getting old. That happens to you and get old. And you know what he said? Because I like to just go see something moving. I don't have to push. You know, it just wearies you. 26 years, I pushed people. I led them, but I pushed them. And I told them, I said, I'm going to lead you, but I'm also going to push you. I'm going to lead you in the way. If you don't go, I'm going to get behind you like a shepherd. I'm going to tap you with that staff. You see, a shepherd, you don't just walk out here and the sheep follow him because they go astray. So he gets in there behind him, amen, or he gets him a little sheep dog behind him. That's what I am. I'm a little sheep dog. I get behind him. Yep, yep. Yep, yep, your preacher's trying to take you where you need to go. Get going. Get going. Quit sitting. Get going. Get out of that fold and get out there and get working. Amen. That's what, that's what I'm doing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I know, no, I, I'm having a good time tonight. Hey, today is morning, isn't it? Been a long time since I got up early today. Look at verse 32. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of Damascus with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. This I do for the gospel's sake. Look at chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, and look at verse 8 with me. 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm racing as fast as I can. I won't get through it. Brother Bushman, you all remember Brother Bushman. Brother Bushman taught me always prepare more than you could preach. So I did. 
Then I decide if I prepare it, I'm going to preach it. <laughs> That's why I'm not be brief, brother, be brief. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our troubles which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm just showing what Paul did for the gospel's sake. What Paul did for the gospel's sake. I'm, I've made this statement for many years. The greatest Christian that ever lived, in my estimation, was the Apostle Paul. Not the greatest man that ever lived. The greatest man that ever lived was the man, God, man, Jesus. And of men born of women, John the Baptist is the greatest, said Jesus. But I'm talking about Christian after the resurrection of Christ. The greatest Christian that ever lived on the face of planet Earth was Paul. You ask me, you put up any preacher in America, anybody that's ever lived in the world with what Paul went through, and I'll guarantee you none of them did nearly what Paul did or came close to suffering what he suffered. That's why God's got him in the Bible and has him say all these things so he can be the example. You see, I don't want to measure myself by somebody who's lower than me. I don't want to measure myself by somebody who's equal to me. I want to measure myself by somebody who's better than me. When I went to play football at Bethany College, I walked on. I was not recruited. I walked in the first day. We were having a meeting. And I asked somebody, I didn't know anybody, I said, can you tell me where the defensive backs are sitting? And they said, that group of guys is right up there. And so I walked up to that group of guys and said, hey, I'm Ted Euston, introduce myself. I said, listen, who is the best defensive back on this team? They said, well, Larry Archuleta, but he's a senior. He doesn't report until tomorrow. I said, when he gets here, I want you to show me who he is. You see, I don't want to compare myself to the second best. I want to compare myself to the number one. And then I want to strive to be better than him. I don't understand. My daddy didn't raise me to be one of these K Sarah Sarah people. Well, if it happens, it happens. No, make it happen. And if you can't make it happen, then at least you can die trying. Amen? And God's Word teaches us to be zealous. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. What sort of hand find to do? Do it with thy might. There is nothing passive in the Christian faith. This passive Christianity is a stench in the nostrils of God. God hates it when you and I just sit back and say, well, you know, if it happens, if we have some time, if I get around to it. I used to have people say that to me. You ever seen those little round to it? A little piece of word with T wood, round wood, says T-U-I-T on it. I always thought as a pastor I'd buy me a bunch of those, set them on my desk. When my people came in, so when I get around to it, I'd hand it to them and say, here, you got one, now go do it. <laughs> Are you having fun yet? Some of you will look too happy right now. You know, I was passing, when I was teaching, I had a list of 100 excuses why I didn't do my homework. Instead of listening to them, I just handed it to the student and said, circle one so I don't have to listen to it. That's a bunch of garbage. Well, the dog ate it. Right. What you mean is you didn't do it. You didn't do it. And you won't make an excuse for it. And that's the way we struggle with the flesh. That's what our flesh does. I know I'm supposed to tell people about Jesus. I didn't do it, but I have an excuse. No, I don't have an excuse. I preached a sermon years ago this one. Excuses, excuses everywhere, and not a one will work. Can I tell you, when you get before Jesus, you won't make any excuses? I won't make any excuses. You know what I'll do? I'll just fall down and say, guilty. 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 When I get done with accountability, then I get rewards. But i got to do the accountability first. Amen? Whew. I ain't looking forward to that day. 
well, I got to tell you, I got so many things that I'm going to have to give an account for. So many times I didn't when I should have and did when I shouldn't have. So many times when I was just lazy and backslidden and all those things. And I got to give an account for those. But listen to me, I'm telling you today, yesterday's gone, but today is a chance to do something different. And tomorrow will be a chance to do an opportunity. And all I'm saying is, is that we ought to get motivated by this guy here who says, this I do for the gospel's sake. This is what I did. What did you do? I don't think he said it that way. I don't think he would say it that way. But that's the way I read it, and that's the way I'm preaching it. Amen. This is what I did. What would you do? I don't think that will be going on in heaven, but I think it, it, it ought to be something we ought to think about. Amen. Now, those disciples said, we want to sit one on your right hand, one on your left. Pretty high ambitions. But God wasn't upset with their ambition. Not one time did he criticize and condemn them for wanting to be that great of a Christian. He just said, fellas, I need to remind you something. First of all, that's received for whoever my father puts there. I don't have anything to say about it. Came to the wrong person. But let me just say this. I have a, a death. I have a death to suffer. Are you willing to suffer that too? Amen. Amen. Well, well, I'll get done here pretty quick. Let me see if I got one more we want to look at. I sent you to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, didn't I? Verse 8, look at it. I like to trace rabbits. They always come back to the same hole. Amen? We are troubled on every side. Troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in. Look at it. He was perplexed. He was troubled. Persecuted, but not forsaken. By the way, all that live godly in Christ Jesus, what? Shall suffer persecution. How persecuted are we? Must tell you how godly we're living. What's well, America? Thank God it's America. Thank God we're not persecuted like there are other places. But I tell you what, if you're the right person, you ought to be in your family, or the right person you ought to be at your job, or the right person you ought to be at your school, you should suffer a little persecution, not because you sought it, not because you're a stupid and, and idiotic in the way you behave, but because you're just living the way you ought to live. And it bothers people when people live right. And if nobody's bothered by the way you're living, must say something about the way you're living. Amen. You see, we're not to be of the world. We're in it, but not of it. We're not to be like the world. We're not to talk like the world, walk like the world, look like the world, act like the world. We're supposed to be different. Different. And that we do for the gospel. That's what we say. Look at me. I'm different. No, because God wants me to live this way. I'm doing it for Him. And that we're doing for the gospel. Everything you say. You know that taking the name of the Lord God in vain? Shoo, I'm going to get on another rabbit trail here. You know what we think that is? We think that's cursing Jesus' name. I have a different philosophy of that. You see, the word taking there means to carry about. And the word vain there means to make empty or of no value. And you know what I mean, taking the name of the Lord God in vain? When you have a Christian life that causes people to have a, a bad taste about Christianity. If that's Christianity, I don't need it. When your life is not bringing glory to God and not causing people to see God's glory and His greatness, your life is causing people to say, well, there's nothing to Christianity. You're taking the name of the Lord God in vain. Because I'm carrying the name of Christ everywhere I go. Everybody knows it. And my life needs to be a life that causes not His name to be nothing, but causes His name to be glorified in something. Let your light so shine before men. They may see your works saying, glorify your Father, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. And so you and I as Christians, we need to have that kind of a life. Look what he says, cast down, but not restrained. You ever been cast down as a Christian? Be a Christian long enough, you'll get cast down. A lot of things don't make sense, do they? Well, I'm trying to serve you, Lord. I'm doing my best. And you know what? Look at what's going on with their life, and they don't have any heartaches. And they say, oh, that's Christianity, man. Psalm 73 is one of my favorite psalms. Surely God has been good for, to Israel, but as for me, my foot had well nigh slipped when I considered the prosperity of the wicked. And they, they, they go out and say, who can, God doesn't know. And they go, and I, have, I have cleansed myself and I get chastened all the time. 
and have all these troubles, you know. You get cast down being a Christian. Sometimes you just got to carry the burden, amen. Why do we do it? For the gospel's sake. Well, I need to get done here. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, very quickly. I'm going to close. i got a bunch more passages. You can maybe write them down if you want. Go read them later. Ephesians chapter 3 and chapter 4 we'll look at, and then I'm going to shut this thing down. Here I do. Challenge you. Go and study the life of Paul. And say to yourself, all these things that Paul did, he did for the gospel's sake. He wasn't living for Paul. It was obvious. He wasn't living for Paul. He was living for the gospel. And by the way, the church at Corinth, that's, he was writing that to believers. The church at Ephesus, he's writing that to believers. Not preachers. Writing it to believers. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was in prison. He was in prison. I mentioned today, we'll go to one more passage and I'll be done. This isn't about Paul, but I mentioned it earlier, I think in my prayer, maybe some other place. But look at Hebrews chapter 11 with me. Hebrews chapter 11 with me. We know the story of Paul. He was arrested, carried to Rome. There died at the hands of Caesar for the cause of Christ. Paul was saved around 34 A.D. and was martyred in 67 A.D. He lived all out full board wholeheartedly for the gospel of Jesus Christ for 33 years. He took three major missionary journeys, established 15 churches, traveling 7,000 miles in a day when you either took a boat or you walked or rode an animal. Who can, who, can, who can know the countless hours he worked in the ministry and providing for himself? He said, I cease not for about three and a half years, night and day, to preach the gospel. He worked all day long and then he preached the gospel every night. When did Paul have his family time? Guess why he didn't have a family, I guess. Nothing wrong with family time, but you know what? We've replaced God time sometimes with family time. Can I say, you, he that loveth father more than, more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. God must be first. Amen. Amen. Think about what Paul did. And look at Hebrews chapter 11. I love this faith chapter. And some of these people have such wonderful stories. Abraham getting Isaac, amen, and all those people. But look down in verse 36. Go to verse 35. Some wonderful things here. Women received their dead race to life again. But watch the next statement. Others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Look at verse 38. What a powerful verse. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these having all, these all having what? Obtained a what? Good report. I wonder what the report's going to be on my life. You know that all is going to get a report card? What's the report card going to be for me in sacrificing? F, you failed. D, you barely did enough. Standing. Sanctification. Soul winning. Let's go down the line of everything that you know in there that we ought to be doing for the gospel's sake. What's going to be the report on me? Listen. That statement, I hope you've listened today and let God speak to you. That statement... When I read that, this I do for the gospel's sake, it just jumped off the page. And God said to me, what are you doing for the gospel? What have you done, Ted? Can I say something to you? At that point in my life, I had decided to be a full-time preacher, and I was serving the Lord. And I was probably doing more than anybody in my church was doing but it still convicted me to the core. Every time I read about Mary who anointed Jesus' feet with that ointment, and I read this statement, she hath done what she could, a knife sticks in my heart. 
And I have to look to God and say, God, I haven't done what I could. I've not even come close to doing what I could. Look, I don't think I'm going to arrive tomorrow. But I sure want to get always be stirred up about making sure that I am moving, working, and laboring to do more for God than I've ever done before. God's not in people backing up. He's in people going forward. Let's stand with our heads back.